welcome back everyone to a special edition of La Cancha. Although club football is going away, we're not going away and we're going to dig into the biggest tournaments in the world, the Champions League. No, I'm just joking. It's the World Cup. <laughs> and, and with that, I've brought in a super panel. It's not just myself and Oscar. There's also Mikhail and there's Illumide. And I want to talk to you guys first about your first memories about the World Cup. I'm going to start with Illumide. Oh, thanks for having me, Taj. Um, my first memory of the World Cup, I think it's something like 1998, I would say. Um, I think that was in Brazil, or was that in Japan? Yeah. I think Japan. that was in uh, 2002, is Korea, Japan. Okay. France, yeah, yeah but so France, yeah. I think that was my, my first recollection. I think I was, what, maybe what, four years old at the time or something like that, so... Uh, it was just, just definitely being around the TV with my dad at the time and just those iconic, I think, French jerseys, um, France jerseys, I would say, uh, was really nice to see. But uh, I can't really remember a lot of the games, like how it went, but I would say that was my first, you know, um, introduction into, you know, uh, World Cup. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Mikhail? Mine was four years after that. Um, I guess due to um, the rainy season in Japan and Korea, the games started a bit earlier than usual. So I think we were heading out before school and you see uh, Papa Bapa Gio do this nice celebration in the corner to knock out the defending champion. So uh, that was, I think, my first experience, at least to recollection. Yeah, your first experience was France getting knocked out of the World Cup. Will they get knocked out of the World Cup this season or this tournament? We don't know yet. Uh, Oscar, yours? Yeah, my first recollection of the World Cup was 2010 in South Africa. And it was Argentina beating Nigeria. Something that <laughs> has happened so many times. <laughs> Unfortunately, Nigeria is not in this World Cup, so Argentina can't beat us. Take that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so all the Nigerians are going for Ghana, right? Or no? Uh, I'm still supporting Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. Stockholm syndrome at its most peak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'll say my first World Cup was 2002. That was when I hated soccer at the moment, and my dad was waking me up at like 2 a.m. to watch games in Korea, Japan, and I was thinking, this man is crazy. But <laughs> <laughs> two decades down the line, I'm I'm glad he did. You did that because now I'm a soccer fanatic or what you say. Uh, let's, di let's dive into this World Cup. First of all, it's, it's an unusual World Cup because it's happening in November, December, and it's being hosted by a country that's not synonymous with world football. They do own Paris Saint-Germain, but Qatar is not a football giant. And I, I want to get you guys' opinions on this World Cup because personally, I believe that this might be, in terms of quality, one of the best World Cups because the players come into it in form. Do you guys share the same opinion? First, start with Makar. Yeah, 100%. I think that, so ethics and morals aside, I think that is the most fascinating part about this season. It's technically, it should be the best, I guess, since we've had since, uh, man, I don't know, like mid-80s perhaps in Mexico. Um, yeah, it is fascinating to see players not running on empty essentially like there shouldn't be any scenarios where like Di Maria pulls up with a hamstring <laughs> after <laughs> the what like, quarterfinals I think so yeah that's I think one of the most fascinating aspects I think of it yeah Oscar yeah I agree with the points that this is coming where everyone is in the middle of the season and they have and a lot of teams haven't even hit their fiscal peak yet. So it will be interesting to see how the players perform and everything. So I think in terms of on the pitch, it should be really exciting. Yeah. And Olumde? Yeah, I do share that sentiment, you know. Um coming like in the middle, everyone is still, you know, um, or most teams I would say for their clubs have most most players for the clubs have all reached their like you know stride a little bit, so they're definitely still hot, so at least getting there. The only thing I would say is 
you know there isn't that rest period that they could have which mm-hmm. some players you know they might say is a, is good for them you know being able to unwind before then re-engaging but anyway we'll see how it goes because you know also the weather over there is not exactly for most people something they're used to so that would be a challenge yeah definitely a challenge especially with qatar the weather this time of the year we don't know we don't really know we're in uncharted territory anyways but let's start let's start with the hosts because they're we don't really know much about them the only player i know from their squad is akim Ak- afif because he's played a Villarreal before but how do we see them getting out of this group because i don't have much faith for them and compared to last last world cup the russia was there there were questions about russia but they came out unscathed but with qatar mikhail do you think there's a chance for them um i think they're better than perhaps most are given credit to i could be wrong completely with that but what definitely is to their advantage is along with Saudi Arabia, they've been able to have a couple months together to practice, work on formation, on certain understandings. That perhaps might be the only sort of benefit. Of course, obviously it's home and um, home countries tend to perform better for the most part. So yeah, yeah, I think that's the biggest takeaway perhaps. Sure. Before before this um, before the last two weeks, I would have said Senegal was the favorite to get out of this group. But Oscar, after the Sadio Mane news, we know Sadio Mane is not going to be in the World Cup. How does this affect their chances in respect of the other teams? Yeah, Sadio Mane is definitely their best player. Without him, it's really going to test Senegal's ability to attack. Netherlands and Ecuador, who I believe are their main rivals to get out of this group. And whilst Man is a big miss, they still have a lot of talent to like, they have Koulibaly in defense and he's arguably one of the best defenders in Europe. So it's not all doom and gloom. They just, it's just, they, they're going to have to rethink their strategy a bit. Yeah, and Alusi says is such a good coach. Like I was really impressed with what it was able to do in the last World Cup, although they didn't qualify. For the Dutch, though, Olimide, like we're seeing a resurgence with them because they used to be questioned a couple of years ago, but now under first under Rono Koeman, they got better, and under Louis van Gaal, who has great experience in the World Cup, do you see them doing better in this tournament? I think, yeah, they, they have sort of, sort of torn the corner a bit, you know, like fresh blood has been kind of injected into the squad. None of the old names were kind of accustomed to. I think I saw someone on Twitter the other day, something about, oh, there's only one van <laughs> in the whole squad. Like one person's name that had van in it. It's like, well, what has football come to? Which is where, like, <laughs> a quite funny thing to imagine or see. But like you said, I think they do have, you know, a new perspective, you know, not the old sort of, um, names we are accustomed to. So they do have that, you know, unpredictability about them. And, you know, with Memphis Depay and Gakpo as well, you know, a lot of forward thinking players, you know, uh, De Jong, I think he's also going to feature as well. You know, people to move them forward and keep them playing, like, you know, att- attacking and engaging in football. So it'll be very interesting to see how they sort of imprint themselves or impose themselves in this um, competition. Yeah, and that's centre back partnership with Delete and, and Van Dijk. Oh, yeah, Van Dijk. Yeah, sorry, probably one of the Van Dijk. Yeah, I, I don't know. He's, he's not on form right now. I would say, relatively speaking, for uh, Liverpool, at least compared to his other seasons with Liverpool, and that's not necessarily his fault per se. It might just be the lag that all Liverpool players are experiencing. But yeah, Van Dijk too would definitely be a key player for them. Yeah, and Mikhail, any of for Ecuador? Yeah, there's one player you'll be quite familiar with attacking and Gonzalo Plato, pretty oh, young him. fellow. And that's pretty much, um, I guess, the epitome of what this Ecuador side is. They're very, very young. I think they are the second youngest team, third youngest team entering the competition, where the coach, Gustavo Alfaro, has essentially 
adopted this idea of playing and going for youth. So um, they're a very counter-attacking side. <laughs> for example, their last six games, um, they have kept six clean sheets with mm. only two goals <laughs> wow. in those games. So definitely relying on a defensive sort of model approach first and kind of hope that their their athletes can essentially try to find some goal from there. Um, their fullbacks are pretty good. Um, Curtis Estupinian, you guys are also quite familiar with from Villarreal currently plays on Brighton and uh, as a left back. Um, Angela Preciado, Preciado as well on the right-hand side is also very good, very quick, technically pretty good. But yeah, they're a pretty good side. They have a very good center midfielder who I'm impressed with. I've seen a fair amount of Brighton play. Um, that is Moses Salcedo, who's I think 21 as well to, finish, to go along with this theme of just very young players. He's, he's, a, he's a very good player. I think he'll be a Champions League level player here in the next few years or so. Yeah, he'll be signed for Chelsea, given the trend. Yeah, yeah, definitely, right? I mean, that's the thing. Like, uh, they're, he, you know, Brighton have been looking at these Ecuador players, essentially. So. But, yeah, it definitely helps them, as we said, that the Saudi Amane injury has um, unfolded, unfortunately. But, they, sh yeah, we'll see. They had the opening game against Qatar as well. So hopefully they'll be up for that. Yeah, interesting stuff. And let, now let's move on to another South American giant, Brazil, Mikhail. And Brazil, there's it's such an interesting team because you look at the team and you're like, wow, they have this amazing attackers, good midfielders. The defense is great. The wing backs are kind of suspect. Do you think they have what it takes to win the entire tournament, not just this group? Uh, certainly. I think they're perhaps the, 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 the main favorite, shall we say. Um, in qualifying, they were unbeaten, 14 wins, three draws. Since Copa America um, as well, they're unbeaten, 12 wins and three draws. 38 goals scored out of those games. Wow. Five goals conceded as well. So Everything is going their way now, but the thing is, you don't, <laughs> we've seen in the past, going into the tournament in form doesn't necessarily justify winning it, especially in Brazil's case. Yeah. What's fascinating about them is since they won in 2002, the first time in the knockout stage they've come across a European team, they've been knocked out. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, yeah, I thought that with Belgium. Pardon? We saw that with Belgium. Last mm -hmm. World Cup. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's definitely, it's been an issue. And I think what makes things interesting now is with the development of the Nations League in Europe and with COVID as well, Brazil hasn't really had the opportunity to test themselves against the European opposition. I think, I believe they played like the Czech Republic a few years ago, right? That's not necessarily a test. Yeah. But their fullbacks are perhaps the weak point for sure. Um, with how they play with the combination of Vinicius on one side, sometimes it's Lucas Paqueta and Rafinha on the other. What they rely on is width. So those fullbacks are not necessarily asked to do the jobs that we're used to with like a Roberto Carlos or a Cafu bombing up. They're kind of more just reserved auxiliary fullbacks, shall we say. Yeah. yeah. And thanks, thanks for that, Mikhail. And Oscar, it seems the second place is going to be between Serbia and Switzerland. Who do you see winning this matchup? It's pretty hard, honestly. And I don't think we should also count out Cameroon. But out of the three of them, I would say Switzerland because they have the experience of tournaments more than Serbia. Serbia, I think Serbia would beat Switzerland in a one-off, but they do badly against Cameroon and Brazil. And Switzerland now have to navigate these things because you always see them get into a round of 16 in these tournaments. It's just that they don't have what it takes to 
go past the round of 16 or in the case of the US, the quarterfinals. So I say Ben Jacques and Co are the second favorites in the group. Yeah, like, like looking at this, I was like thinking between who's the favorites for this. And I look at Switzerland and I remember how well they performed in the Euros. But you look at Serb, that Serbia team with Milikovic, Savic, Tadej, mm -hmm. Jovic, Blaovic, Gudeo, yeah. Milinkovic. And yet it's it's such a team brimming with talent that you expect yeah. them to, to get out of it, no? Yeah, and first, to be, to be very respectful to Serbia, they've been really good in the last two years. They were really good in Nations League qualifying. And like you said, there's a lot more talent than... You didn't even mention Vlahovic or <laughs> Dricic. Like, there's so, there's so much there. I just think that Switzerland's know-how would get them through it. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, Summer is unstoppable at times. So that, that's another team. <laughs> yeah, not to forget Shaka. Shaka, yeah. you know, He's probably going to be that captain, right? I think. Yeah. yeah. This game, I just want to say one thing. The game between Switzerland and Serbia is going to be the game of the Rockets. Man, you have Goodell on one side, <laughs> and you have Xhaka on the other side, just firing missiles at, <laughs> at Summer. And, yeah, so I, yeah, it's going to be an interesting game for sure. Yeah. And Alumde Cameroon, any chance? Well, I think, you know, for most of these um, sort of competitions, your very first game has a, you know, massive indication on how well you play or how things might turn out for you. And uh, so I think it's all depending on how they perform on that very first day game and how they're able to, you know, set up with like a, you know, a structure, a very decent structure for them going forward. Um, but I think they do have a chance. I'm trying to see the schedule. I think they're playing Switzerland first. So that's going to be a very tough one, I think. Yeah, on both, versus summer. Yeah, they, they both teams will want to not lose. So, you know, it might be a bit of a KG matchup. Because you know everyone's kind of saving themselves, like okay, we need we need as many points as possible, because we know Brazil is probably going to come and wash us away, that sort of thing. So um, they do have a chance. I think most teams often do. And um, well, at my money won't be on them if I'm being honest. My money. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So let's move on to another favorite, France, and. The last European champions, they've all gone out in the group stage, but this group looks achievable for France. There's no way they're going to muck it up when they are, are they? Definitely not. Like, you just have to think of the, you know, the Real Madrid players they have in their squad right now. I think those players are probably the ones that are performing um, at the highest, I would say, for the, yeah. for the uh, respective countries. So it's definitely going to be, um, yeah, looking at the, you know, the other, um, the opponents, Denmark is the only one I think might sort of stand a chance in a, you know, one-off kind of game. But yeah, they should win this comfortably, like win all three games with everyone sort of, you know, firing and all cylinders for them. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll ask a question regarding the midfield because that's been highlighted as a form of weakness. Mm. I know you mentioned the fact that Trombini is there, Kamavinga is there, mm. Adrian Rabio has had a bit of a renaissance recently, but do you still feel that the absences of Pogba and Kante is going to affect them? I think definitely. Just thinking about the impact those two players you just mentioned, Kante and Pogba, had in their Euro um, showing, it, it does sort of, you know, it, these players are definitely not tested, you know, uh, Tichemeni and uh, Kamavinga, so it's definitely going to be a lot to live up to. They do have the quality, I think, to live up to that. It's just, you know, when, you know, the ball meets the, you know, grass, are you able to perform and, you know, essentially, you know, play bigger than you actually are? Because at this point in time, they have no, you know, experience at this sort of level, at least for France as of yet. So there definitely will be missed, you know, Kante and Pogba. I'm surprised. I guess because of the whole, you know, issues with Pogba and I think Kante is injured right now. So that's 
probably the only reason why he's not, you know, featured in his squad. He's always like a just kind of stable name for France at this point. But they'll miss them. And yeah, it's definitely big boots to fill for Gismani and Kamavinga. I think those would be their, you know, star players in the midfield to sort of provide balance and some sort of transition play for them. Yeah, and don't forget former Arsenal man Guendouzi, who's been brilliant for Marseille, and he's a true. of the leader there too. True, true, true. I he has, yeah. I think for him as well, that's also going to be like big shoes to fill. I'm not sure. I think of the three, who would you say is the most creative, or oh, out of all the midfielders, you know, the ability to? I'll say Rabio is probably the most creative, right? Like picking a pass and sort of, you know attacking play yeah and also also say Tremaini because when I've seen him play for Real Madrid it reminds me a bit of a younger Paul Pogba like he doesn't have the shooting ability mm. in terms of his range of pass and the way he goes forward it can mm. be found out a bit defensively but in terms of just going forward it seems like a brilliant player for them fair enough yeah it should be fun but yeah they should coast through the group stage and just look forward to their you know knockout uh, upon opponents yeah yeah, that'd be super exciting. Oscar, I'm going to come to you for this. Can either Australia or Tunisia knock off any of the top two? Uh, no. No? <laughs> no. Are you going to get... No, no it, it, okay. is that, it is that this is the only group where, besides maybe Group E, where the best two teams have a serious gap with the other two teams because Denmark... France, we know their quality and strength in depth, but Denmark have been really, really good in the past few years. They were really good in Nations League qualifying. We all know their fairy tale story in the Euros and everything. So I feel like those two should easily get through this group. I just hope that two of them don't play, like when France and Denmark meet, they don't play as badly as they did <laughs> in 2018, because I still remember that game and I get headaches from how bad it was. <laughs> Funny enough, Australia was in their group. Kind of makes you wonder about the draws and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, we can spend an entire yeah. hour draw conspiracy theories. Yeah. But this year is the year for your boy Messi, though. Like, um, Argentina, they're going to be in a quite a competitive group with Levin Disney and, and his <laughs> Poland and Mexico and the great Saudi Arabia. Ah, Argentina, they've had few replacements so far for um for replacing one Korea for another Korea but Scaloni's yeah. comments makes my ears go up because he was talking about the players who aren't at the level and he wishes he could make some changes to the team is that just in terms of injuries should Argentina fans be worried about this yeah I think there are a couple of Argentina players that have come into this off the back of terrible seasons so far um, like the Sevilla players and <laughs> yeah. Nahuel and Nahu Molina, they haven't had the best of seasons so far. You also have the loss of Los Celso. And for Argentina, what has made them successful and unbeaten since 2019 is the fact that they, they have a stable set of 14 to 13 players. And with Los Celso being missing, we look at it and it's like, okay, who's going to fill his boots? Will it be? McAllister, does Papu Gomez have the legs or even the quality at this point? Because I'm sure this Sevilla season has drained him. And yes, the comments definitely is going to be something that worries Argentina fans. But then when your main players like your Messi, your Di Maria, your Julian Alvarez are playing really well, you can just be like, okay, maybe he's just talking about players that he's not even going to use. So... Yeah, I yeah. feel the positives, the positive feeling around Argentina outweighs the negative feeling from these injuries. Yeah, it really does. And do you, well, in terms of Lewandowski, like he's coming from Barcelona, you've obviously been watching him and being excited for how he's done well at Barcelona. Is this his moment to maybe take a step up after what happened in the Euros? Yeah. The thing is that it's not going to be exactly easy because of there have been changes in the Poland setup. You know, the manager for the Euros is not there anymore. I hope I hope I'm not wrong. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll look stupid. But yeah, 
because I have this fr Polish friend that has been complaining about the national team and everything. So it's not Poland as a country aren't really in the best frame of mind yeah. and the best frame of form. But definitely, given that this is Lewandowski's last World Cup, I feel he'll be very motivated. You also have Zielinski, who has who is yeah, arguably, he's yeah, he's. He's arguably up there at London in terms of how good he has been this season. You know, there's a couple of old heads in the squad that you can be like, okay, these guys have experience, but should you really count on them at this point, you know? So it's been interesting. I, I, have, I don't know if they'll have what it takes to beat Mexico to second place too. Yeah, yeah, Macau is going to talk more about Mexico because Mexico too, they have their own doubts with the coach. Tata Martino has been criticized recently, obviously with the rise of Canada and the US, Mexico. It's like they're having a moment of crisis at the moment because they're not the best in CONCACAF like they used to be. Yeah, certainly so. <laughs> certainly so. Yeah, Martino is under just, <laughs> I guess the entire press is just having their, their nice face towards them. He's under a lot of pressure, shall we say. Um, while Mexico, they've always played well at World Cups and so on and so forth, but this year there definitely is this impression that they're not quite as good as they usually are. Um, there's always been this obsession with Mexico essentially getting to the quarterfinals, where it's, they seem to always get out of the group but losing the round of 16. This year, however, there's a lot of people suggesting that it'll be Argentina and Poland. So, Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. one of those people. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I am as well. I mean, they, they have good players. There's just, just some issues, I guess, going into it. Um, you know, Lozano, essentially, it's unfortunate that... Um, Jesus Corona is injured um, from Sevilla, but even then, it's Raul Jimenez. Since his head injury, he, he struggled to really get 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 back to it. He did. I guess this kind of just shows uh, Mexico's just problem in general is that he Jimenez led um, qualifying and scoring, but with three goals. However, those three goals were all penalties. So there's trying to kind of get the ball and get it in the back of the net seems to be a bit of a difficulty right now heading into this. Yeah, yeah, maybe they just have one that one good game against Saudi Arabia and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for Saudi, no hope for them. Zero points in this tournament. Oscar? Yeah. You know, I was just thinking right now. Given the problems I've mentioned Poland have and the problems Mikhail has mentioned, Mexico have, maybe Saudi Arabia might just <laughs> surprise us all. <laughs> yeah, you can get out of the group. <laughs> stranger things have happened. Yeah, stranger things have happened. But let's go back to Mikhail and talk about party in the USA. There's so much optimism with this USA's team. And they have lots of young players coming through, like Musa, like... Um, I was going to say Pulisic, but he hasn't really played that well. But it seems exciting, especially the guys in Leeds who are doing so well for the U.S. Mm -hmm. Greg Berhalter seems to have a very positive camp. Is this the year that America makes it past the, the group stages? It's a difficult group. Statistically speaking, to take FIFA's rankings, you know, for what that matters, this is said to be the only group that has four teams in the what, in the top 20, essentially. Wow. So, yeah, it will be difficult. The, the thing with the U.S. is they are extremely young, I think, kind of. Uh, heading into to qualifiers, they were the youngest team, I think, that qualified. But I think they're the second youngest team at the tournament. Um, they do have some very, very nice players for the future, even currently, I guess. Um, you know, that midfield trio of Tyler Adams, Eunice Musa, and combination of Weston McKinney, if he's healthy, or Brendan Aronson is really, really interesting. Extremely athletic. I mean, Musa is, Musa is 
it's kind of insane that the U.S. managed to get him from, you know, the combination of countries of England, Italy, that, you know, you clearly would see him playing for in the future. But, yeah, the thing is, the U.S. looks to play a very proactive style of football. I don't necessarily think that's conducive to the players that they have. But, yeah, we'll see. It's a difficult group, though. They're very difficult. And on talk about someone who's played in the U.S. recently, who won the MLS Cup, Gareth Bell, how do you think playing in the MLS would help him against the United States? Ooh, tough to say. I mean, I definitely know he enjoyed those uh, those L.A. golf courses. <laughs> I think uh, part of the reason he went to L.A. as opposed to a Premier League side is to essentially keep fresh for this moment. But, yeah, he tends to deliver for Wales when it matters. So definitely a player that I think could cause, cause a lot of havoc for the other three teams in this group. Yeah, Olympia, England, it's since in the last four years, they've been so good in international tournaments. They came close in the World Cup. They came close in the Euros. You can say the path was easy and all that. How do you, do you see them finally making that breakthrough in this tournament and finally bringing it home? Unfortunately, I do not think it's coming home. Uh, they're just, I, in my opinion, um, questionable picks, especially in the uh, defense um, for England, where selections of people and sticking to the guns you know, in terms of oh, sticking, I guess, with maturity or the more mature players could be their downfall, in my opinion. But again, those players do sort of perform. When I say those players, I mean Maguire and Eric Dyer, sometimes they do come up big for them in these tournaments. So I guess that's what they're banking on again. But definitely, if you to go on their club form, um, they, apart from Tottenham, I think, let in, have let in one of the most goals in the Premier League this season and you know Manchester United are sort of always sort of on the verge of losing a game every other day or every other game he uh, Maguire plays so they do have a lot of prospect going forward Foden right now is probably in you know the form of his life um, Saka is also playing well for Arsenal um, Harry Kane has just been his prolific self as usual so they do have weapons going forward and um um Again, I think when I think of the people they have like in the creative midfield, like let's say from DM and a CM positions, is a bit still in a sense. But again, they can can you know get through with this group. But once they face, I think the top of teams, the Germany, the Brazil, France of the world, I think they will they they will struggle, and you know they would definitely be found out. And I think um, that's where I think. My my ceiling for them would be semifinals again, um, and that again would be against the the lock of the draw in terms of who they face. Because I think I think they will beat beat anyone they come out that comes out of Group A. They'll beat anyone there, but um, you know, for quarterfinals uh, or semifinals, I think they would struggle after that. So it's, we'll see. And how, how much is their struggles down to the coach? Well, uh, he's been, you know, the the belief is there in him that he's the man for the job. But then so so many times it, it's almost obvious that the tactics being implemented are just not, you know, um, progressive or almost to, I don't know, defensive in a way for England where they do play better when it's high tempo, sort of, you know, fast pace um, attacking football. But sometimes it does sort of fall into this, oh, we're going to sit back and kind of hit you on a counter attack, which they're not, I, I don't think they're the best team at doing that. So um, the coach definitely, I, I think this is his last, you know, chance to just kind of sort of get it right. And depending on how the chips fall, you know, he could be out of the job, you know, after this. And uh, definitely his tactics as well. When I say player selection, 
isn't the best, especially for me in the, the defense. So at the end of the day, he's just, you know, counting on his players sort of, you know, stepping up and playing for the badge and making England proud. But like I said, I don't think he's coming home. Yeah, the one player I'm excited to see for England is Jude Bellingham because I, he's been so good for Borussia Dortmund. Mikhail also has a very high view of him. So, Mikhail, what makes him so special and how do you think he's going to affect England? Bellingham, uh, he just has every element of the game he essentially has as a midfielder. Just robust. Not quite the lungs that a Fetty Valverde has, but just, just everywhere. Very tenacious. For a teenager as well, to have sort of leadership skills, to be captaining a, a club side outside of the country, you know, outside of your language, it's, it's phenomenal, I think. But yeah, it, he definitely looks like the player that <laughs> will go to show um, why everyone in Europe wants him, essentially. Yeah, and I think Lumde also has very high views of him as well. Yes, yes. I basically, I don't know why I forgot of, of all the players in the midfield, but Jude Bellingham, yes, he is, I think, along with Foden, the people that can sort of make things happen for them, especially in that transition phase from, you know, kind of, uh, you know, midfield to attack sort of thing. So I agree, Jude Bellingham would definitely be one of the key players for them. Yes. And speaking of countries where the manager is hugely under pressure, he's so under pressure, he decides to become a Twitch streamer, right, Oscar? <laughs> uh, that's Luis Enrique for you. The guy never fails to not entertain. <laughs> entertain, I mean, and he's just a, an all round lovable troll. Like, yeah. he just love to see it. But yeah, uh, I would say. He's under pressure like Southgate, but, you know, the pressure is more from fans online. A certain club has a huge fan base in Spain that would rather see him gone, no? Uh, Which club? I don't know. They play in white and um, they're they're from the city of Madrid. So, yeah. But... (laughs) Raya. Yeah, Raya, maybe. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, we, we spoke about Spain last week and there's yeah. been a change in the squad with Dyer getting injured, which has enraged the entire Valencia fan base. Alejandro Baudet has come in. Um, do you feel that's the right call from Luis Enrique? I feel like if Gaia's injury wasn't as serious as this press reported that he could have waited because Alba can play left back and he in the last game against Jordan, Laporte was able to fill in there, but it seems that wasn't the case. Yeah, the obvious picks were between Baldi and Alex Moreno. Alex Moreno is the better player, but then you have to consider the fact that he was never on the pre-list to begin with. So it seems that everyone knew he was going to pick. If it wasn't Baldi, it was going to be Alonso. So I don't get why people are just crying. Honestly, at this point, it's tiring. It's like, you know how this man does his thing. Just let him do his thing. If he succeeds, fine. If he fails, laugh at him. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, like, like going, going on the field, though, with Spain, they had a big issue in Euros in terms of scoring. Do you see that continue to be an issue? Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to lean towards yes more than no. While like you say, they like Spain, they play really well in between the boxes, but especially in the first box, they only scored 15 open play goals. That's the, one of the lowest in qualifying. So that's a problem. And then that problem, it doesn't come down to not being able to create chances because they have so many creative players and so many ways of creating chances. But then your main striker is Morata, who on his day looks world class. On another day, he looks absolutely useless. <laughs> so I feel the thing is Spain's attack especially has a lot of potential, a lot of exciting youngsters. So it's going to be interesting to see if they can all fill in and chip in and share the burden. The potential yeah. is there for your question, the answer to your question to be a no, but 
Yeah. Right now, I'm going to lean towards yes, but I don't think it will affect them in the group. Yeah, and I'm excited to see Nico Williams. I'm sure most of you have never really seen him play, and he's had such a great season for Athletic. I'm also excited to see Ansifati and how they combine, because the one thing that Spain lacked in the past was that pace going forward. Yeah. And I feel right now, they have that with the players that they've selected. If Luis Enrique picks them, that's a different story. Yeah, that's the thing. There's a lot with the with the with the two players you mentioned and your opinion. There's a lot of pace and trickery too, and a lot of good white play. So it's not going to be all cutting inside all the time and expecting Alba or whoever or Carvajal to overlap. So, like I said, there's different options to cause problems. It's just for them to take their chances. And someone like Ansu Fati definitely has the potential to take this team's attack to another level. It's just that. He hasn't had the most exciting season so far, but hopefully he can have a good World Cup and then kick on for Barca. <laughs> yeah, Mikhail, Hansi Flick has gone to Germany. Do you see him having that same impact he had with Bayern with Germany? Uh, he's certainly trying to. <laughs> he's certainly trying to. It's essentially a Bayern model in terms of how they play, with pressing and the high line. Um, but the issue is, as one of the recent Nations League games against England showed is that high line, they're quite vulnerable in the back. Um, unlike Bayern, they don't have an Alfonso Davies to kind of just sweep up those long balls that are played over. But in a similar fashion to Spain, I think currently the issue for that team, um, in addition to the fullbacks, is the fact that they don't necessarily have a striker they kind of do. Mukoku, um, 18 years old. Havertz, um, what he's done, you know, for Chelsea and for Germany at times, playing as a sort of false nine, um, is an option. Um, another option is uh, Fulkruck from Werder Bremen too. Fulkruck and Mukaku just got their debut, I think, a couple days ago. So. But they are a good side. Yeah. Yeah, they are. And um, it will be super exciting to see which one of the two, between them and Spain, finish top or if they both go out. Because Japan, too, are not to be uh, dismissed. They were really good in the last World Cup. They have some interesting players like Kubo, uh, I think Kamada from Eintracht Frankfurt as well plays for them. So... They're not a team to be underestimated. Costa Rica, I'm not super sure about them. But which one of the two do you think, Macau and um, Oscar, do you think will cause more, more of an issue for Spain and Germany, Japan or Costa Rica? I think because Costa Rica are going to be a defensive team by nature and are going to be more defensive against Spain because of how Spain play, I feel they are the ones that will likely cause a problem for Spain. While I can see J Japan causing more of a problem for Germany because of how dynamic they are, and they won't necessarily be afraid to go for the Germans, especially as they have defensive weaknesses. Yeah. Okay. Um, Japan, had they been in any other group, I would probably be fancying them to get out. I think they're a good side. They press extremely well, have very good technical players, but you know, two juggernauts. It's difficult. The, the way that Costa Rica play, Oscar is completely right. Kind of just absorb pressure and try to spring on this counterattack is the recipe for trying to get by sides such as Germany and, um, and Spain. Spain. Sure. It'll be difficult, though. I mean, <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I still think the two will qualify easily. It's just about how they do against each other. Yeah, yeah it will be. Belinda, you're a big fan of Cristiano Ronaldo. This week is set the world on light, but not for his football reasons for the interview with Piers Morgan. He said if he wins the World Cup, he'll retire. Do you think he's going to retire after this World Cup? Uh, well, I guess it depends on how well he thinks he's played in the World Cup. <laughs> because for him, beyond the actual you know, winning a lot of times is doing it in style or his own way. So I could see a scenario where he does win it and then 
some other club because it seems, you know, his time at Manchester United is all but over. So some club, you know, sees that performance and believes in him being able to recreate that for that for their team. And, you know, he then, I guess, at the right price would, you know, make that switch, I guess, depending on the club or the pres- the prestige of the team as well. But, uh, yeah, like you said, he hasn't... <laughs> Put himself in the best of lights, you know, by his that, um, interview. So it's definitely going to be interesting. And I, I said earlier to Oscar that they were my favorites, or they are my favorites to potentially win everything. And um, I guess if I was to talk about their, you know, qualities or what I think, so to separate them from other teams, it's not. I'm gonna say it's not much, but it's just my belief that in terms of they do have, I think, better attacking players now in terms of Rafa Leal, you know, has been amazing for uh, AC Milan. Uh, Bruno Fernandes has been kind of often, you know, here and there for Manchester United. Uh, Yao Felix, I think, can always, you know, uh, create something out of nothing for, for uh, the Portuguese. And definitely will be like, you know, interested to see how they sort of tackle their more t- you know, tougher opponents. Although I think as well, their group is a, might be, in my opinion, the group of death. Yeah. Again, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I would agree with you because Ghana's... Ghana, they've brought in some, Europe, some players from Europe to improve their squad, like Inyaku Williams. You have Son South Korea, and you have Uruguay, who tend to historically do very well against teams like Portugal. Yeah, yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, and with Portugal, though, how do you see them? Because they're another team that they have an issue with their coach. Like, they don't like the way the coach is, the coach plays, but it's been quite successful for them. Do you feel they should change their approach or they should just follow on what Fernando Santos has done in, for Portugal thus far? Because he has won a year with them. He has been quite successful, but in the World Cup, he's falling short a bit. Mm, that that's a good question. Um, it definitely can be an issue when the players don't sort of truly believe or get behind the coach. So you can only hope that, I guess, the individual talent or some of the players can kind of push them through. You know, like you know, match winners that sort of thing. But um, just watching them play as as well, like you said, I think they. They would struggle against a Uruguay, I think, who are very sort of compact and tight in defense and oftentimes would just try to um, almost wear the team down or wear the opposition down in a, in a sense. Um, so I think they, you know, the players are able, of the coach is able to at least sort of get enough of the squad, at least maybe, you know, like kind of playing for him and kind of rooting for him. Maybe that kind of, you know, spreads across the whole, you know, team and everyone is sort of buying in. But it's definitely going to be a challenge for him uh, trying to win every one of us, especially, you know, some people who have bigger egos than, bigger egos than others in the team. So yeah. it's definitely going to be a challenge. So, but I still, again, I still fancy their chances again because of the sort of players where they do have certain match winners in different positions. Yeah. Yeah, they really do. And, Macau with Uruguay, since Alonso came in, they've been really flying as a team. They they have young players. They have Valverde, who seems to be one of the best midfielders in the world at, at, at some times when he's scoring golazos every week. Um, how far do you see them going in this tournament? I see them going quite far. I think they have a very good side. The recipe of um, what Lumi Deja said of having a very compact defense is we've seen the recipe for a good knockout um, success. There are some lingering questions though, as you've just mentioned how good Valverde has been this year. Ben Tukor has also been pretty good for Tottenham. It's, do we play a three in the midfield or do we play two in the midfield? With Vecino as a sort of a defensive midfielder that gives license for the Valverde and Ben to kind of, you know, attack, roam, do things. Whereas in a two, it's kind of restricting them, perhaps. But then with a three, 
that brings up the issue up top is where you have Suarez, Nunez, Cavani, who I think will come off the bench. But those in the two, um, Nunez and Suarez, work better than when the, it's just Suarez up top and then Nunez is kind of operating from the left. So a bit of issues there. And in the back, of course, you know, with Orujo's injury, Godin is also injured and just aging. What do you do there? Um, some issues definitely that Diego Alonso has. He will definitely know more than we do about whether or not his players are healthy or not, but they definitely look like a good side, though, and wouldn't want to face him in the knockout stage. Yeah, if Let alone the group stage. I shouldn't <laughs> say this group stage. This group does look very difficult though yeah it is difficult i don't know if you've seen Araujo in on instagram with your guy squad the guy looks like he's ready to fight and die for his country so. <laughs> south americans for you <laughs> <laughs> so it should be fun um oscar with iniaki williams he's one of the signings in quote unquote position marks for ghana in this world cup like how big of an impact do you think it'll make yeah, he's definitely going to be a threat to anyone they play against because of the ability to run in behind, how fit he is, the intelligent runs he makes too. His finishing has improved this season. So I think he's more of a threat than I thought he was going to be before Ernesto Valverde came in and unlocked this guy. <laughs> so, yeah, and not just with him, with you know the IU brothers, Thomas Partey, and others, they're going to really going to cause problems. And given, like Olumide has said, Portugal and Fernando Santos have some issues to sort out. Ghana could be looking at this and be licking their lips and say, maybe, just maybe, we can fancy one of these two and South Korea. Yeah, yeah, South Korea, we barely mentioned them, but they have uh, Sonaldo, right? Olumide, is that going to be enough for them to cause of a fuzz i mean he did kind of spark you know for tottenham uh, or explode sorry not even spark for tottenham a, a few weeks ago but um i think they'll need a bit more um but, you know his his fitness would definitely be tested you know because i feel like everything will be running through him and uh, yeah, it will be the main man to sort of create and almost sort of get at the end of things at the same time for the team. So it'll be very interesting to see, you know, how superhuman, you know, he could be for them. But yeah, the, and, you know, like when a team is kind of struggling or doubting their managers, you know, every other, even though the talent that Portugal have, every other you know, team in that group will be, you know, looking at Portugal and saying, yeah, we can we can do something here. We just need to sort of frustrate them long enough where, you know, they may, you know, want to throw the tactics out of the window and then start playing, you know, like more individualistic. And then if, you know, the other team is more composed and more together, they can then capitalize on that. Yeah, they can. And let's move on to our final group with Canada, I'm sure. The Canadian audience was must have been waiting anxiously for us to discuss their country. Mikhail, I had a conversation with you recently about Canada, and I, I was very pessimistic about their chances. But you know what? After after our conversation, I'm kind of more optimistic, and I'm looking at the Belgian team, and I see what you say. They have such an aging backline, an aging midfield. The forwards are somewhat aging or out of form. Lukaku, who is the main striker, who's done so well for them in the Euros. He's been injured for most of the season. So do you see a scenario where Belgium, first of all, gets knocked out in this group? Because it is a strong group. Yeah, I mean, today kind of affirms that they lost to Egypt, barring, I think, one or two of their starters. Um, yeah, they look very creaky defensively. Um, for Tongan and Alderweireld are in their 30s. They're playing... Uh, in the Belgian league as well. So that is definitely the, their big question. I think from Canada's perspective, they are extremely top heavy. Their defense uh, isn't quite that good. Uh, I mean, isn't that great at all to be completely <laughs> frank. I mean, when you compare it to the sort of the midfield players and the wingers and 
strikers they have. But yeah, like just looking at that side, I mean, Steven Estacchio, uh, Tejan Buchanan, Alfonso Davies, of course, Kyle Lauren, Jonathan David, all of those players have significant Champions League experience, right? So yeah. when you consider that and just the sheer pace that Buchanan and Davies has in particular with David, his movement, they're definitely something to be afraid of um, during transition periods. From that's, their that's point of view, of yeah, yes, exactly. And the thing is, from their point of view, they know quite clearly how a Croatia and Belgium will play, essentially formation-wise, the players in those formations. So maybe it's those tactical adjustments that'll help them there, perhaps, is what the optimism would be for, I guess. Yeah, and moving on to Croatia, Oscar, like, looking at this team, they seem like they seem like they could do something again in this World Cup because you look at the midfield and Modric is still going strong. They have guys like Kovac, they have Brozovic, they have Pasalic, they have Lovro Maher, who's supposed to be the next Luka Modric, and in defense, they have Gravidal, who's everyone in Europe, half of Europe wants. Up top, they have Orsic, who is brilliant as well. So this team seems destined to win this group. Yeah, yeah, my big favorites for this group. We, and Mikhail has talked about the fading light of the golden generation of Belgium. I think they have enough in them to finish second, but Canada and Morocco definitely have enough quality to make that second place a contest. But definitely Croatia are the team to watch out for in this group. And I think they have a good chance at another deep run. Deep run. Yeah. And with Morocco, I'm excited to see the Canada versus Morocco game. I hope there's something riding on it because of Yassine Bono, who was born in Canada, but represents Morocco. And that'll be, that'll be fireworks. <laughs> yeah, that'll be something to look forward to. Yeah, because I hope it's something that has a lot on the line, say knockout qualification and whatnot. Yeah. So now with the group stage done, I'm just going to ask the panel, starting with Oscar, who's going to win the World Cup, your favorite for the top scorer, and who's going to be your revelation team and player? Revelation team will be Uruguay. I think they'll reach the semifinals. Revelation player. Uh, this one is a bit tough. <laughs> Ansu Fati. Ansu Fati? Mm. Big chart. Okay, top scorer. Um, I'm going to say Benzema. Benzema. No, sir. What, what am I saying? Mbappe. Mbappe. <laughs> and and then to win it. Winner. <laughs> Winner. <laughs> I'm saying this more in hope. Okay, I hope Spain will win it, but I think realistically. Is between Argentina and Brazil. Okay. I'll just go with Argentina. Argentina. I think I think Spain can reach the semifinals, but Argentina will beat them and then beat France in the final. I know. Wow. Big, 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 foreign, big choices. Uh, Mikhail? Oof. For Revelation team, I think Denmark will be the, the team that I don't want to say they'll make the semifinals. But I wouldn't be surprised if they do. I think they're very organized. That midfield trio of Delaney, Hoiberg, and Christensen. I don't think there's that many midfielders better than that in the tournament. Um, top scorer, Laura Martinez, let's say. I think that group stage, I think they'll manage many goals. Uh, Start by those. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, what else am I forgetting? Player. Um, yeah, who's going to be the surprise player? I think in the knockout stages, I think we'll see some Enzo Fernandez from Argentina, the center midfielder. Yeah, he's been good for Benfica. Yeah, he's been very good, particularly with Lo Celso's injury. 
and I think Oscar said earlier how it's been Papu Gomez and uh, McAllister playing as like the choices. I think in the knockout stage, we might see them kind of try to play a bit more defensively, perhaps. Uh-huh. And the winner, oh, splitting hairs between the two South American sides. Don't know which one. Oscar said, Oscar, who did you say just now? Argentina. So I'm guessing you'll say Brazil. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Say Brazil. <laughs> and uh, Olympe, you're going for Ronaldo to win it, no? I am. I think after hearing myself analyze the Portugal team, I'm like, uh, are you sure? You know, I mean, you have said how some of the, you know, issues they're having might impact the, their play. But I'm, I'm, I do think they do have, you know, a balance of young talent and sort of the old guard to steady the ship. So I am still thinking Portugal to win the whole thing. Um, so I'm going to kind of work, I guess, in reverse. Um, Portugal to win the whole thing. Uh, top score, score would be... Would be... Hmm. I'm trying to think of a team that would rack up a lot of goals, like, in group stage. My default idea is almost to go with uh, someone in the French team. Like Probably Benson. in England, another one that can rack up a lot of goals. Yeah, Kane. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of yeah. penalties too. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's also a shot. I think it um yeah, prior to this conversation, um Kane was who I had my my money on, but I just wasn't sure what sort of England I would get. That's my issue. Where would they be, you know, adventurous and forward thinking and or be more sort of oh let's just kind of play within ourselves in a sense. But okay. For just to answer the question, I would say, hey, uh, for top goal scorer. Um, so when you say breakout player, would you say someone who isn't already established on the world stage, or like could, someone who Sonos and Sonos established, but like people underrate that just does really well that no one expects. Okay, for that I would pick someone. Um, I think Tukumeni, Tukumeni, right? Uh, mm-hmm. For the French team that that would be he does show like you said you know that kind of young Pogba vibe of just composure and almost like elegance on the ball and Kamavinga is almost like a I don't think as industrious as a Valverde but he does get stuck in and almost seems to be everywhere sometimes the way you know Valverde, Valverde does I think for a close second Valverde too is also just on one I think I don't know what he's, yeah, what he's been smoking or eating, but it's it's been you know fun to watch him play. Um, and then what's the last one again? The, uh, the the surprise team. Surprise team. Hmm. Jeez. Netherlands could do well. I think they don't really have so much expectation of them because almost the you know like they they have they have no real player there that has kind of been there and experienced sort of the you know competition level or high level you know um, competition for Netherlands so they almost I think are playing with like house money in a sense so that sort of freedom I think could help them you know Probably pose an upset, upset if they face, you know, uh, I don't think England would be able to face Netherlands if they both top their group. So maybe them beating Wales and then facing someone else in the, you know, quarterfinals. That should be fun. Yeah, as well. should be. Should be. For myself, I'll say surprise team will be Croatia because, like, I know they made a World Cup final, the last World Cup, but I just feel people don't really expect them to do much in this World Cup and they have gotten better. So I think it's going to be them. I have say for a breakout player, I'm going to go for Yunus Musa because he's been so good and I feel in that US setup, you can create a lot of chances and do well. In terms of top scorer, I might go for Ivory Kane because I can see England racking up a lot of goals in some of these games. And the winner, I think, will be, I said Spain, so I'll just go with Spain. 
although although that's my heart talking, not my head. My head exactly. My heart is talking, yeah. talking a lot here, yeah. yeah, but yeah, I know. We can, we, can, well. we can only hope and just enjoy what happens. Yeah. yeah. What does your head say though? My head, my head unfortunately says France will destroy everything. <laughs> okay. What about you, Taj? Friends. <laughs> That's why I'm hoping that they include in the group stages and save everybody a lot of trouble. <laughs> no, there's no way they choke on the group stage. Like you've seen that group, there's no way. Uh, yeah, yeah like where, you said, where do things Denmark, happen? Denmark and France are too strong for Tunisia and Australia, but who knows? Yeah, who knows? Oh, uh, Mikhail? Yeah, just a quick question. Do, so given we, I mean, we all know the knockout stage is just one game, which means there's a lot of luck and randomness, I guess, involved. Do you, any of you guys, can any of you guys see any of the big sides not getting out of the group? I, I, I mean, think, oh, sorry, keep going. No, go, go first, go first. I'm still organizing my thoughts. <laughs> okay. Um, I think Portugal do have the hardest group um, in as much as I want them to win, largely because of Ronaldo and everything. They do have the trickiest opponents who can kind of just grab a win or foil, foil their plans and, you know, draw the game. And then, you know, it then sort of puts them as a point deficit where they're struggling and not number one or, you know, waiting until the last game where you, okay, I must win or I have to win to progress. I would say Portugal probably stands the the highest chance of not making it just because of the quality of the other teams. Oscar? I'd say, again, like I've highlighted the potential for Spain to just blitz people and if they get the end product right, but if they do this nonsense thing where they just draw games, they might create problems for themselves. I still think they'll go through, but they and Germany have the ability to make life very difficult for themselves. Yeah, I, I think Belgium, I, I highlighted them before. They have that issue. Another team that might be right out risk is Uruguay because there's, there's a chance that things might not go well in that group as well for them. And we have to remember that Ghana is going to play Uruguay. And remember what happened last time Ghana played Uruguay. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> yeah, let me, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say, let's uh, pour one out for Italy, for them not being able to make it, because <laughs> doesn't really doesn't feel like a World Cup without them it's in some way. I feel like, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's yeah. just, I still wonder how they didn't make it, because... <laughs> And that's it for you, though. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, and I just want to thank everyone for coming on the podcast. Thanks, uh, Olimide, for taking time out of your busy schedule, as, as well as Mikhail and Oscar for doing this. Um, it was a blast having this conversation. I'm sure the listeners would enjoy this conversation as well. And I just want to tell you guys, thank you. No problem, man. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Yeah. Till next time. Till next time. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>